Hey everybody and welcome back to the 6th Round Post Fight Show with me, Zane Simon, and my co-host, as always, Eddie Mercado. We are here once again talking about this week's UFC card going down in Newark, New Jersey. Colby Covington beating Robbie Lawler in the main event of UFC on ESPN5. And a kind of shockingly one-sided fight, especially considering that for the last half of it, Covington pretty much didn't get any takedowns. Yeah, this was beyond depressing for so many different reasons. Yeah. And like, I just, I feel so many different types of way about it. But I think um, you were talking about this before we went on air, but it, it has to just be a game plan that didn't pan out for Robbie Lawler. Yep. Yep. It has to be that. There's no other logical explanation for why Colby Covington is outstriking Robbie Lawler the way he was. Because, yeah. It, after the first two rounds looked very Kobe Covington. This is what everybody was expecting. Full on wet blanket, get the takedown, make Lawler work to get back to his feet, rinse and repeat. But then he just breaks away in the third round and just starts throwing this low powered volume at Lawler. And all Lawler did was just kind of roll with the punches and do a little Philly shell and throw a jab back here and there. But he never just turned on the horsepower and let it loose on Covington. And it was sad to see because I'm, a, I'm yeah. a huge Lawler fan. And it's like, why why is this going on? Yeah, and I, I really think it's just that that the pace in those early couple rounds was so high. Like, I mean, to, to Lawler's credit, I think the fundamental idea of the game plan he was trying worked perfectly, which was he got Colby to spend a bunch of energy, push a huge pace early, get Tired, at least not to the point that Covington ever stopped throwing, but tired to the point that Covington couldn't really easily get takedowns the rest of the fight, which I think had to have been the plan. But that pace in those early rounds was so high that I think Robbie's arms were just burnt out by that point. And his own punches looked stiff and slow. He was able to crack Covington a few times, but even when he could, he just didn't look like he could put the speed together to catch Covington without walking into something. And credit to Covington for the pace he was pushing and yeah. being able to sustain that all the way throughout. Yeah. Like once he started just throwing the low powered volume and it was like, okay, well maybe Robbie is going to try to Homer Simpson him and like, Oh, Covington, we've seen Covington get tired. Yep. You know? So it's like, yeah, maybe that's the deal. But like he never he never dropped down a gear. He always stayed at that pace. Like he didn't slow down. He just kept at it. And it's almost as if Rob Lawler was just a, a sitting duck out there. It's like I don't know if he was injured or like what the case. I mean, he was classic Robbie in the post fight interview. You know, oh Covington was the better man and all that. But this I don't know. That wasn't Robbie Lawler. That's that's one of the weirdest Robbie Lawler performances I've ever seen. Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of reminds me a little bit more of like, I mean, you know, there might also be a couple things into it. Like, it kind of reminds me of kind of, you know, maybe Strike Force Lawler, guy who just wasn't that into the fight. And also, we've seen Lawler at times get really frustrated by wrestlers and just kind of very clearly not enjoy himself. Sure. But that's so, usually because it's that throughout, not because yeah. the dude doesn't just all of a sudden switch gears and decides to put on a striking clinic. Yeah. Like, that's this is the weirdest shit ever. It, like, it's a really weird fight. Covington, the dude that got outstruck by Maya. <sighs> yeah. This guy is, is piecing up Robbie Lawler. Like what, what planet are we living on right now? What dimension is this? Yeah, well, you also, before we got on the air, said that it must be fixed, and I mean... Oh, why'd you have to go there? Why'd yeah. you have to go there? I'm not saying... You talk, it, you're it, talking it, about it, how I'm weird it is. You it, know. This is weird. This is definitely weird. I know, I know. I don't think it's fixed. I'm I'm not actually pushing that, yeah, but... We're not saying it's fixed. I'm just no. saying it's weird. And it's, it's the weird. I, I've ever seen out of Lawler. I think that, you know, maybe he, get, maybe he just really... Got Lawler out of like out of his interest in the fight, maybe, and gassed him out, just tired him out. Because you know, I think 
Lawler, like he could, he kept moving defensively and he was still like there and walk, moving around stuff and takedowns. He wasn't exhausted, exhausted, but I think he was very like very professional composed fighter exhausted. Just like, yeah, I can hang around and I'm going to be in this and I'm not going to just totally shut down and be like hands on my hips tired, but I may not be able to actually do anything more than that. He was very reserved, just very yeah. reserved. Maybe he was sick. Who knows? Yeah. He would never Otherwise, come out and so, say that. He's like that guy, you know? He would never do anything to take away the credit from the other man that won. No. On the other hand, though, we got to say, this is exactly the kind of performance Colby Covington needs to convince people that he's a real threat to Kamara Usman. Oh, man. He needed this. Like, there's like, never been anything on, on film or paper that shows Covington as a rounded threat. Yeah. And, like, on paper, now you can say, oh, well, look at the strike count that Covington put up against one of the greatest knockout artists ever, Robbie Lawler. And, like, people are going to spin that in, in like, a direction I hate. And I know the true fans are going to hate. But, you know, it is what it is. He's getting He's getting exactly what he needs. It might actually get him the push to get him the title shot next against Kamaru Usman. Even though I think Masvidal earned it and, and you can't do better than what Masvidal has done, like back to back. But, I mean, the way the UFC was talking in like the post-fight band, yeah. they were really kind of playing that Covington versus Usman angle. And Usman, too, when he was in the booth, he was like, you know, I really want him to be my first title defense. Talking like... You know, he, he wasn't talking like a man who was thinking about being back in the cage next month against a top contender. He was talking like a man who's thinking about being in the cage in three or four months against Colby Covington. Yeah, I think that is what's going to happen. Yep. So tough, tough for Masvidal. Great performance for Covington. And like I say, I mean, the thing is, like, even if you say not, even if you don't want to say like. You, you want to look past just numbers and know that this was an exceptionally weird fight. The part, the part of, of this that makes it feel like a performance Covington really needed to face Usman is just the idea of somebody who can put out over 100 strikes around every round. Like, that and is not kind peter of thing. out. Hmm? And not peter out along yeah, the way. Yeah. And that, like, that's the kind of thing where if they're going to stalemate at all on in in their wrestling games, then that's the kind of edge. Like, that's the kind of thing Colby Covington had to show that could give him an edge to really be in that fight. You know? Yeah, this perform. I mean, it definitely, it definitely. You you see why Colby Covington is championship material. As far as his fighting goes, he is elite. His wrestling is phenomenal. And tonight we saw that, yeah, he is capable of, no matter how weird it is, he is capable of throwing and landing X amount of strikes without gassing out. And that is impressive. Yeah. So we'll credit him. It, you know it's coupled with a very good wrestling game. And that, you know... It's not like Kamaru Usman is the world's best striker. He's a much improved, but can be slightly wooden striker. So, yeah, but I mean, it's not like this performance it, it gives anyone the idea that 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 Covington's about to end a fight on the feet. No, no, it doesn't give that intention. But it's just he could win on points. He could. Uh, he could outpace and tire Usman out standing, just putting a pace on him. Mm -hmm. That's that's the thing is that pace. That's that's scary. Yeah, because like Usman put together an amazing pace and fight to beat Tyron Woodley. Mm -hmm. Just remarkable. Still only through still through three hundred and ninety strikes total. Uh, over five rounds. And never breaking a hundred in any one round, where it's like that. You know the kind of pace that to just contrast the kind of pace that Covington put on, where they don't have the complete stats out yet, but he threw a hundred and twenty-two strikes in round three. Yeah, you know, 
Man, that was so weird. Yeah. Wild fight. Unfortunate result for, I mean, okay. Especially, you know, in light, especially of his Matt Hughes joke after the fight, I don't think anybody can really stand by and say that Colby Covington isn't a douchebag. Um, the character. The, well, whatever. I, I mean, when you're making jokes about like a dude who got hit by a train, does it really matter if it's a character or not? I mean, like, it's a character. It is a character, but it's a character he's happy to live with. You know, this is true. He he he's enough of that guy to be very happy to be that guy. And <laughs> it, he's choosing it. He's definitely choosing it. Yeah. So, Covington clearly a douchebag, but a lot of fighters are douchebags. I don't want to get any, anybody get the idea that I just wanted Covington. I, I didn't want to see Covington win this just because I don't like him. There are plenty of fighters out there. I don't think that Robbie's some like ultra you know liberal progressive or anything like that. Most fighters are pretty damn conservative. That it is what it is. I'm not going to be. Well, no, you wanted to see Lawler win because he's yeah. Robbie freaking Lawler, and he's I'm, he's I'm a just legend a of the sport. Huge Lawler fan, so it's a tough loss to see out of Robbie Lawler, especially like you the know? way it happened. I yeah. think I would have felt a lot better if the entire fight looked like the first two rounds. Sure, sure. The fact that Covington separated and just started throwing this low powered volume. Was like, yeah. like old Robbie would have would have been disgusted at that. He's like, "This is what you're throwing at me? Are you kidding?" Oh my goodness! Like, I just, ugh. I gotta move on. Let's move on. Yeah, let's move on. All right, all right. Co-main, Jim Miller, Clay, Clay Guida, awesome, fantastic fight for all of 58 seconds. This was great. Yeah. Best case scenario. Both just came out swinging hammers. Guida hurt Miller with a counter. Miller hurt Guida with a counter. And just like you could, Jim Miller could not have asked for a more perfect setup than a slightly dazed, quick Clay Guida shooting a double early in the early in the fight. Just yeah. exactly what Jim Miller needs as a born early finisher who has tended to fade slightly as rounds go on. Like. He jumped on that guillotine, and that was fucking it. That was the exactly... More weirdness, this is the third tech sub of the night. Yeah. Third. Three. Three people went to sleep via choke tonight. And and this is the second um, time someone dropped down with the guillotine and won. Yeah. That never I mean, happens at this level. No, it's true. But it's also like... The people going for it, mere sharp, like in, in both cases, I see exactly why it was. It, it was smart moves in both cases yes. from fighters who are incredibly able and, like, I trust them to make that decision. Where they now actually transition to a triangle, but yeah, we'll get there. But uh, yeah, just fantastic work from Jim Miller, and I got to say though too, with the three tech subs on the night. I don't actually blame any the ref for any of those. Hell no, you can't. No. It's not. It's not. How is it the referee's fault that Clay Guida didn't tap? Yeah, like that's that's, that's crazy that the announcing team even uh, attempted to make a comment about that. Like no. it's the referee's fault. Clay like Guida shot them, in. None of them were the ref's fault. No, none of them were the ref's fault. They they were all in positions where they could have tapped. In, in the case of Trevin Giles, he did tap, but both of his taps came on the other side from the ref. And they, you know, it was like the ref can only be in so many different positions at the same time, really only one position at the same time. And if the hands are on the other side, he could try to move around as quick as he could to get over there. But, you know, that doesn't... It's just the situation. Yeah. So... It's bad luck for Herb Dean that he had to be on the he had to be on the wrong end of two of those tech subs where people are going to look at it and be like, oh, he should have seen both times. But in, in the Miller situation, in the Guida situation, he shot in. I think he went out really damn quick. And you know, most guillotines guys don't go out that quick. You're gonna you're looking at that situation. You're looking at where somebody is, and you're not thinking, 
oh, this guy went out the moment he hit that double leg. Yeah, that was just the planets aligning just right. Guida was dazed, plus exerting all his energy going for the double leg on top of Miller's squeeze. It was just the recipe for disaster. Like, that is not the rest fault for night for. For, and I mean, it's not really Guida. I don't even think Guida might have had a decision, a chance no. to decide if he wanted to tap because it was so fast and he yeah, was so I, dazed. And it's it's Miller's perfect sub to get. Like, just one of those situations where you're shooting in, especially that early in a fight. You know, the first thing going through Guida's fight is like, I am not getting fucking caught in this. I've got a whole fight out ahead of me. I will fight through, and then he's just out. You know? Yeah. Well, who knows? Because he was rocked, man. Yeah. It was so crazy because Guida threw that right hand and it wobbled Miller and then Miller threw his haymaker left and it wobbled Guida and then Guida shooting in. And the next thing we know, Guida's unconscious. And it's like, what? That was great. Yeah. Yeah. Super fun. For that, <sighs> Nazrat Hawkprost, Joachim Silva, another really fun fight. Hawkprost looking like a killer out there, honestly. He's looking like a future title contender. Yep. And he's he's how old is this kid? Twenty three years old. Yeah, young, real young. Who's he rolling with? GSP and Farasa Hobby. Yep. Like this is. I don't know if he can keep uh, keep his nose clean. I don't see any reason why this dude isn't heading heading up the ladder quick. Yeah, no, he's, you know, other than a debut loss by Triangle, he's only got that that uh, debut in the UFC loss to submission hel- or to Marcin Held, where he he's basically a just... submission wizard. And it was, that that was just like Hawk Parast, a young fighter, tangling with Held on the ground, being really confident he could out-grapple him and finding out he couldn't. Like, that's that's no shame to Hawk Parast. Wait, did he get that. submitted? No, he lost his debut fight by submission. In that fight, he just lost by decision. Okay, okay. He just kept trying to tangle with Held on the ground and, you know, like Giles Mearshart, but without actually giving up the sub. (laughs) God, that fight was terrible, though. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to that in a second. But really, great win for... Hawk Parast, and it's hard not to think that he should be headed for a pretty good fight, a pretty big fight next, you know? Yeah, you gotta, you gotta think. I think they're, they're bringing him along nicely, though. Yeah. Uh, man, this was cool. The first round was just this real technical striking bout. Hawk Paras looking to land his southpaw cross, and then Silva trying to explode with more fancy techniques. And then come round two, Hasparak just kind of switched it up and was like, okay, I've been throwing that left straight down the pipe. Let me put an arc on it. And boom, he uh, yep. instantly dropped Silva and put up some really brutal ground and pound also. That was, well, that was getting real scary there for a second. Yeah, I'm glad the ref was on top of that. It's good to see, too, for a young fighter who's, you know, you're looking at as a future title contender. Like, the title fighting style, the style that it takes to be champion for most fighters at the top level is a style where you're you're slowly building your game, you're reading, getting reads, and you're progressing over rounds to adjust to your opponent. You know, you look at most of your champions de- out there these days, they're not people who just go out there and try to stomp on somebody. No. Not anymore, at least. A lot no. of them started their career more that way. And so for Hawk Parast in this fight, like, he came out and he did a lot of pressuring on Silva, did not throw a lot early, just kind of let Silva attack off the back foot, read a lot of Silva's strikes, got his timing, comes out in round two and just absolutely stomped him. And like that's that's the kind of savvy that you want to see out of somebody who's looking to make a title run. Yeah. Like he wasn't looking for the knockout. It just happened because his technique was yeah. set it up. He he broke down Silva's game and that opened up the strike. It was beautiful. Made. What I'm curious to see is if he comes away without any injuries, because he was coming off of a hand injury, and mm. we know how reoccurring those can be. I mean, those yeah, are the career injuries. So I'm really curious to see if he's if he's all good, if that's a, a non-issue moving forward. And I think he should get the winner of Maribek Taisumov and, and Carlos Ferreira coming up. Yeah, that'd be a lot of fun. I was also thinking the winner of Islam Makachev versus Davi Hamosh. Sure. Either of those would be a lot of fun, I think. 
I'm all for those. That brings us to a that middleweight battle: Gerald Mearshart, Trevin Giles, and a future I, depressed us fight. Of course, yeah, maybe. I don't know. I mean, it's the thing with Giles. I'm so worried about this. Thinking about it going in, when I'm picking him, he's the young prospect. He's fast. He's athletic. And it's just like he is so defensively relaxed. Like he just does not look like he's thinking about defending anything ever at all. Could that cost him against somebody like Mearshart, who is a tough as shit, and be really strong, a really strong, consistent grappler? And yeah, it did. Like, I don't know what he was thinking, constantly trying to out grapple Mearshart, but it was not a good. It was not a good move. I don't know. I feel like his biggest downfall is that he's just like too nice of a guy. Could be it. Like, I feel like he was in so many positions where he could have just rained down some brutal ground strikes, but, like, instead just controlled and tried to burn out Mearshart. And, like, Mearshart's doing the same exact thing. They're trying to burn each other out, which made for some boring grappling exchanges. Yeah. It's just, I, I don't know. I mean, Giles, he, he just, especially his attitude standing, I think he just kind of... He expects his speed and his athleticism to get him through bad situations, I think. So he doesn't really feel like he has to ever push the pace. It's just kind of like, oh, well, you know, when my moment comes, I'll get it. Yeah. And, and once Mearshart actually started to actively hunt for the submission there in the third, like, it became a different fight. Yeah. Like, he, he, he was close with the guillotine and then readjusted, locked it up a little different, and put Giles to sleep. Yeah. Strong win for Mearshart, keeps him in the middleweight division. Big setback for Giles, though, because now he's, you know, they kind of tried to bump him up. Like, oh, yeah, this looks like a prospect with a ton of promise. Put him in there with a couple of solid mid, mid-tier mid veterans, and uh, he's just getting sat down. I think he's just too nice. Might be too nice. Although he's a cop, so maybe he's just a really nice cop. Cops are nice people, too. Yeah, sure, given value. <laughs> I mean, the profession as a profession kind of means a certain amount of not niceness. You can't be permanently nice in that in that business. But uh, you can be kind hearted. You can be kind hearted, though. Stern but fair. Stern but <laughs> stern but fair. That's right. All right. You could use a little more stern and a little less fair. I think. Right. Exactly. All right. Uh, catch weight bout before that. Scott Holtzman, Dong Yun Ma. And uh, great performance from Holtzman. Exactly what I expected out of him against a fighter like Ma, who was going to give him a lot of time and space to set up the power shots he wanted. He beat on Ma like a bad son. (laughs) (laughs) Come on. I had to. I had to go there. Hey, I I kept my, you know, they should start the... Tell, Giles Corner should start telling telling him that all of his his opponents are perps on the run. <laughs> but uh, I kept that in under wraps. But now you're coming with the the child abuse jokes, so I got <laughs> it's it's elderly abuse jokes, really. Yeah, yeah, an old son at that point is true. <laughs> Anyways, Holtzman looks phenomenal out here. He scored an early knockdown, had tons of top control. Uh, he did get mixed up and, and turned into a brawl and allowed Ma to get back into it. Ma scored a flash knockdown there in the second. But, I mean, Holtzman instantly got up and started throwing again, landing again. Uh, what pissed me off uh, was when Dominic Cruz was fumbling all over his words trying to rename the Von Flew choke. Happy birthday, yeah. Jason Von Flew, by the way. Just had a, a recent birthday. Um, they got to stop doing that. Like, it's they- not the St. Prue choke. It's a Von Flew choke. Yeah, I mean, I'm willing to call it a St. Prue or a Von Prue choke. I like both of those. But, like, Cruz wasn't even listening. And it's like, yeah, no, we're calling it the Von Prue now. He's like, no, nah, we're ta- not talking about Von Flues anymore. We're talking about the OSP choke. It's like, nobody's calling it the OSP choke, dude. Yeah, Von Prue is good. I like Von Prue. It's a, it's a compromise. It's a compromise. But, yeah, I mean, he also calls a, a keg stand a beer stand. So, you know. Dom's all over there with the terminology. This is true. (laughs) 
Bless his heart. Still, strong performance for Holtzman. Looked really great. Should be, you know, he's he's really become a very fun action fighter in the middle of the lightweight division. So, I always enjoy watching him fight, uh, especially yep. if his opponent is willing to stand in front of him. Yeah, well, unfortunately, Dong Hyun Ma, like he really he started his career as such a banger, and then he's like, okay, that's a really bad idea. I just lost a couple, you know, I I lost a couple fights by bad KOs. I should take my foot off the gas and sit out at range and try to be craftier and more careful. It's like, yeah, but you still don't have any defense. And now you're just not putting anything on anyone. (laughs) Yeah. Sometimes the best defense is a good offense. Yep. Holtzman and Smith both just were like, well, I guess if you're going to just sit there and let me set something up, I'll just blast away. Well, well, speaking of, I guess we know who the next matchup to make for Holtzman is. Oh yeah. Devontae Smith. That'd be fun as hell. That, that, that just, that screams opening up another Fox card. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which I'm glad they did because initially the bout order was looking like they were going to have that light heavyweight bout opening up the Fox card. And someone caught wind of it was like, oh, no. Oh, no. We need Ma Holtzman opening up this main card here. Yeah. Let's talk about that Kennedy Nzichukwu fight versus Darko Stosic. And, man, that sucked. <laughs> it was a slog. It was a well, slog with like, it was a slog that had extra moments of slowness. It's like, hey, this is slow already. Let's call timeouts. You know, let's yeah, take these well, breaks. So she just couldn't stop kicking in the chukwu in the in the nuts. Nope. Three low blows for Stosich, two separate point deductions, and he was like surprised he lost the decision. Now what's crazy to me is apparently they misread the scores and. The judges actually would have scored Zichuku, uh with the win no matter what. But it seemed like a much clearer case of the wildness where Zichuku won one round and still won the fight. Yeah, it was a weird fight because yeah. Stosic started out landing these really heavy leg kicks. Yep. Like, I'm just going to call him Kennedy. I'm not even going to try that last name. Bless your heart for trying. Yeah. So, yeah. Kennedy pressed forward, and Stosic was just lighting him up with leg kicks, and they were super effective and damaging, but they weren't backing off his aggression. No. It wasn't until Stosic was mixing in his big punches that Kennedy was actually backing off. So Kennedy was willing to walk through the leg kicks. He was willing to eat them for the chance to get close enough to land his knees that he was trying to get off. Mm-hmm. And like he wanted to be close enough, but it also took away the option of moving backwards as a defense for the leg kick. So his leg just got lit up. But round three, the pressure had done its job on slowing down Stosic and the, the constant ball shots and losing points for Stosic took his mind out the game. And round three, I mean, it was just forward pressure, forward pressure, forward pressure. And the leg kicks stopped coming. And it was, uh, he started going for takedowns and, I just, I'm really, it's, it blows my mind that he thought he actually won. It was, was sh- visibly shocked that he, he didn't get the, the nod. Yeah. I don't know. It was, I don't know what was going through his head. I, I, honestly, just overall, like, cause it's not even that like the pressure was really what put Stosich on his heels. Stosich just backed up a lot. He was intensely unwilling to go forward and throw his hands, even when it was very clear that he had to do that. I don't think he realized he had to do that. I honestly think he thought the leg kicks were it. Like that they were landing, yeah. they were hurting. And I think he didn't he didn't realize that it was his punches that were actually the, what was backing off Kennedy. Yeah. That's what he should have stuck with. But just an ugly ugly ass fight. But how do you lose two points and then and that doesn't put at least a little bit of doubt in your mind that you lost the fight. Yeah. Because, I mean, like, he, you know, they each had a round where in the second round, in the first round, Stosic landed 29 significant strikes to Nzichuku's nine. In the second round, Nzichuku landed 26 significant strikes to Stosic's 15. And round three was basically dead even, 16 to 15. And, you know... Plus like, meaningless takedowns. Plus meaningless takedowns. So I pushed, like, 
I pushed the first and the third for Stosic and the the second for Ntuchukwu. But even if you win, if even if you win one, two rounds, if you lo- lose two points, you're losing that fight. Like yeah. you can't, you know. Uh, Winning two rounds to one is a 29-28. It, you, you're only one point ahead. You lose two, it's 28-27. Like, you've lost that fight. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's a, if it's a math issue. <laughs> Maybe. Or <what>. But <laughs> he was shocked he lost. Yeah. Get, get a slide rule out there for him. An abacus. An abacus, yeah. All right, that brings us to... A welterweight bout, Mickey Gall, Salim Tuari, also not a great fight. Um, no, it was competitive. Yeah. Credit to Gall. His car- his cardio looked improved from his Diego Sanchez fight, but also Tuari looked like he gassed out after about a round. Yeah, I mean, he really Gall really went all in with the whole he fought Diego Sanchez sick. And- yeah, he, you know, I mean, that's what fighters got to have – they have to have be able to invent reasons they lost any fight. Like I think that's just a core part of. You've never really lost. You could win. You could beat everybody on any given day if the circumstances. It could be, different. but I, I had food poisoning for my fight out in Thailand. Yeah, and like it sucks so bad. And like my flight left the next day for Japan to cover the re- rising card, so like I couldn't reschedule, and I de- I definitely wasn't backing out. So it's like. You know, I traveled all that way. I trained all those rounds, put in so much time and effort. Like, I had to fight. Yeah. So, like, I understand why fighters fight when they probably shouldn't. And, like, how much that sucks and, like, being zapped in there is, like, the worst feeling ever. Mm-hmm. It's almost like you're helpless. Like, it sucks. It really sucks. So, like, if that's the case, like, I definitely understand. But uh, I'm also the type to, like, you know, when I came out, I was like, yep, I lost my fight. I wasn't like, oh. I was sick, and that's why I lost. I was like, oh, I lost the fight because the dude beat me. Well, so, like, you know, I think maybe there's that's... something to be said for being... Like, how I was saying Robbie Lawler, like, he would yeah. never say anything to take away the credit of the man who beat him. No, well, that's, you know... Even Robbie the Ben Lawler Askren is a whole shit. different breed. But he also, he, he also might, you know, it, it's also a different thing, too, of, like, what you say in public and what you believe in private. Lawler also might believe that, you know... He's never really lost a fight. He's just not going to tell anybody that. <laughs> this is like, true. Now we're getting into some like some a whole another part of of one's honesty with themselves. Yeah, like I mean the the difference of you being like, well, I I lost and that's fine. Like maybe that's you know like maybe that's what separates you from the people who are willing to try to make uh, an entire living doing this. It could be. I mean, you, you definitely have to. You have to vibrate on a a different frequency. That's for sure. There's a lot of self-belief that needs to happen and be be preserved to believe that every time you step in the cage, you are almost certainly going to win, you know, because that's that's how you got to be. If you don't think that, then things are going to go bad in a hurry. I mean, that's why people speculate that after someone gets knocked out once, you know, it's only downhill from there. Yeah. I mean, you know, I I, people want to talk about USADA and uh Orlovsky? No, uh, what the Brazilian bantamweight. Um, damn it! Why am I? Who got beat by TJ Dillashaw? Remember oh, everything, uh, but Pen and Barrow. Pen and Barrow. People want to speculate about that, but like honestly, the beatings he got from Dillashaw. You watch Pen and Barrow fight, and you can. It, it feels like you can see the moment in fights now where his confidence crumbles, where he starts thinking. Oh, I got a little bit hurt. I got a little bit tired. Shit, this is where it all starts to go bad again. You know? And like some of that's, or maybe a lot of it's psychosomatic, which could be maybe an explanation for why Arlovsky's chin has actually gotten better. Like maybe, because yeah. I know he's he's publicly stated that he's gone through, you know, a sports psychiatrist and all that. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe he's been working that part of his mind to to build himself back up. And like, yeah, I mean, a lot a, of the chin is such a weird thing, though, man. A, a lot of the ways people get get knocked out are they? It's you know, you get knocked out by the punches you don't see coming, which means you get knocked out by the punches that surprise you, and you get surprised by strikes when you're not confident in your ability to hang in in the fight. 
when you when you don't feel like you can take shots, you start to turn away, you start to flinch, you start to try to guess what's coming. That that's when you get surprised. That's when you get caught out. So in that way, like the more confident you are in your ability to take punches, I think there's a very real ability for it beyond also just physical posture abilities, natural toughness mm-hmm. and things like that. But right. there's just natural a real man. like confidence is going to make you harder to be knocked out because you're going to you're not going to you're not going to get surprised as easily. Well, I'll say this, regardless of whether or not Mickey Gall was sick when he fought Diego Sanchez, I don't want to see the rematch. No, I'm good. nobody wants that fight. I don't need to see it. No. Zero interest whatsoever in watching Mickey Gall fight Diego Sanchez again. Yeah. You had your opportunity on the day. You lost. That is one of the tough shit things about this sport. It's not soccer. You don't get to, it's not baseball. It's not a five game series. You know, you don't, right. you don't get to come back and play him again next year. Like, you had your chance. Uh, that brings us to a woman's flyweight bout. Antonina Shevchenko, Lucy Pudilova, fun as shit fight. Everything, anytime Pudilova's in the cage, she's fun as hell to watch. And Shevchenko really showed up. This was beyond great. This was, uh, I hope they win fight of the night. Because this was, this was just awesome. We got everything. There was blood. There was stand up. We got knees, elbows. We got submission attempts. Like this was just, this was great. Yeah. Really a lot of fun. And just, you know, I feel for Pudilova because it's clear to me still she's improved a ton. But it's such a like how far she had to improve from, you know? Yeah. Like she just got to the UFC super raw as this just wild, unstructured, aggressive prospect. And... You know, she she can improve, but, like, going from Gian Kim and Sarah Morris and Irene Aldana to Liz Carmouche and Antonina Shevchenko, like, it's kind of, you know, like, success, su- succeed or fail, she's only kind of fighting better fighters. And so she's kind of getting outpaced all the time. Yeah, and I don't think... I don't think she was expecting Chevchenko to be as good on the ground as she was. No, yeah, I doubt. I that. think she was she was really shocked by that. Um, as good on the ground or as good in the clinch. I think Pudilova probably really thought that if she could get this fight in tight, she could bully Chevchenko, and she landed some great knee- el- elbows in there to change the fight. And you know, yeah, I mean, she had Shevchenko. to expect Chevchenko to have a clinch. I mean, well, I don't think she didn't expect her to have a clinch, but. I think she probably thought that she could maybe muscle her, you know, body her a little bit. Yeah, just I mean, be she did tough. Really well too, which is yeah. I'm surprised she was so willing to just keep the fight on the ground. I think she just didn't want to stand with her, you know. Yeah, it could be. So, the had round, a reputation. She came out and instantly closed the distance, looking for the takedown. Yep. Yeah. How about that little ninja move that Shevchenko hit to take the bag? That was slick. That was slick as shit. I don't even like, you know, I think I when I was writing this fight up on Twitter, it's just like Shevchenko wins technical submission, some wild, crazy shit. I don't know. Like, that was totally, totally out of left field. So really great from Shevchenko and just a brutal submission for Budalova to get caught in and absolutely true to her neighbor, true to her nature, refusing to tap in any way, shape, or form. Like Guida didn't have time. Pudilova was just like, I'd never even consider it. You and know, tapping. What's that? Again, yeah. not the referee's fault. No, not like, the referee's fault. And it was like, honestly, I don't even know if she could have tapped because that was like a belly down, rear naked choke. Like she, she was tapped. laying on her own hands, I think. She could have tapped. I just don't think she has. She. I don't think tapping to her is an option. Like, I get the feeling that you know she's very much the. It's a Gracie thing. Yeah, like the Gracie Die mentality. It's like, well, if you can break it, break it. You can choke yep. me out and choke me out, man. But I, I'm really impressed with Shevchenko. She showed a nice wrinkle with her grappling here because not yep. only did she get a technical submission, 
but she hit that really close arm bar after getting split open there in the first round. Like that was super tight. Credit to Pudelova for escaping. Um, but that was that was like, wow, you're dangerous off your back, even when you just get your wig split. Good to yep. see. That's promising. Yeah. She's, you know, still not the youngest prospect in the flyweight division, but she's technical enough that she's going to be a, t- even if she doesn't improve a lot, she's going to be a very tough fight depending on the matchup. Yeah. And this division is really getting fun. Like, yeah, there are so they, many fresh and intriguing matchups to make here. They've hired a ton of talent for women's flyweight. Like the, the elite, of that division may not still be deep enough to challenge uh, Valentina Shevchenko right now, but they've got like f- almost 50 fighters in that division already, you know? Yeah. It's, it's getting good. Yeah. And this whole card honestly was a, was a flyweight party altogether. <laughs> so many flyweights on this male and female. Well, just one male, but still. Yeah. Before that, it was Matt Schnell, Jordan Espinosa. Huge win for Matt Schnell here. Really, like, he has bounced back amazingly well after a couple of, couple of tough knockout losses to start his UFC career. Yeah, this was nuts, man. This He made quick work of Espinoza. Yeah. This was, it's like, if you're going to be jumping in a guillotine at the elite level, this is how you do it. Yep. Schnell came out. He tagged Espinosa with something really hard. Espinosa shot in for the takedown, but immediately found himself fighting off a guillotine attempt with his arm trapped, mind you, by the legs of Schnell. And then the moment he escaped, he found himself then fighting off a triangle attempt. And then Schnell made all the right adjustments, hooking the leg, pulling down on the head, grabbing the arm. And I mean, Espinosa was in quicksand the entire fight. If you... If you can pull for, if you can jump for a guillotine and have that kind of triangle transition already in your back pocket, like that's the kind of thing I want to see. Where somebody, I want to see that person jumping for a guillotine. If you if you don't have that kind of transition, you're making a huge mistake. That's probably going to get you beat up and lose the round. Yeah, but something like like Schnell clearly. He knows that, and I and I remember watching him reg- regionally. He was very willing to pull guard or be on his back, and then hit, look for submissions or look for sweeps. So it's clear, like he's practiced these kinds of transitions into his game, and he's hit it twice now in a row, and it's really starting to pay off. Yeah, he looked really good out there. Like this was, this was awesome, and yeah. you know he dropped his first two UFC fights, but he's won four in a row now. Back to back triangles in the first round, and he was lit on the microphone in his in his post fight speech. So, yep. this is super great news for a division that's going through a complete renaissance right now, and needs fighters with reasons to care about him. And good for him too. Backstage, the uh, somebody he had, did an interview where somebody asked him, "Well, you know, as cut down as this division is, you're like right in title contention now. Does that make you happy that like?" the division's thin, so you get to be right in title. And I was like, no, they should hire like 40, 50 people. I want to be like, I want a, to be able to build to a title shot and build momentum and get fights and get excited, you know, build hype and things like that. So definitely yeah. a dude who wants to see a lot more work out of the UFC around him at flyweight. And then all around great reminder that if you are going to be jumping a guillotine at the elite level, at least rock your opponent first, <laughs> yeah. hit him with something hard, and then maybe have a, a backup transition waiting. I'm just yeah. saying. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult. It is. It is. All right. Before that, women's flyaway bout, Lauren Murphy, Mara Romero Barella started out a slow burn, but all credit to Murphy, she slowly got – Barella's timing, and by that third round, she cracked her with an uppercut when Barella came in. She perfectly timed and stuffed the takedown when Barella tried to shoot in, and then just wrecked her with that knee. Yeah, this was awesome. It's like Murphy hit a turning point after yeah. it was in the second round when Barella had top position and just kind of gave it up. Yeah. And from then on out, it was it was all Murphy. Like she just started grinding and landing landing all sorts of stuff, getting Barella backpedaling, and then that knee was just, that was beautiful. 
Yeah, great to see from Murphy. Kind of felt like much more of a return to form all the way back to her Strike Force days when she was a very, or her Invicta days rather, when she was a very uh, aggressive, grinding, push forward fighter. So. Yeah, it was good to see her come alive with the volume. Because yeah. it bothers me when fighters press forward without the volume. Mm -hmm. Like, that really irks me. Like, Robbie Lawler was doing in the main event for some reason. Yeah. Uh, man, that's going to bother me for a long time. But anyways. Um, Murphy, this is great because she's coming off of foot surgery, I believe. And she uh -huh. just got back with, like, her old squad. Yep. So it's it's nothing but but good news. Seeing her move the way she was... Like, that's great. This was nothing great. And maybe Jillian Robertson or Vivian Araju next. Both had Yeah, they already booked Robertson game. versus uh, Macy Barber. Instantly made that, uh, made that fight happen after Robertson's last win. Okay, so that is happening. Well, then Araju, who makes even more sense because she beat Alexis Davis, a seasoned yeah. vet. Murphy's like right. This is like the logical next step. Yeah, yeah. no, it's true. Because... Yeah, it's either that or, you know, maybe, like, I can't remember what else was I thinking in this division. Not a lot of other obvious choices, really. I was thinking maybe Pollyanna Patello, because since her fight just fell apart against, uh, she was supposed to fight M Marina Moroz, so. Have I mentioned how much I'm enjoying this division? Yeah, it's fun. Like I'm I said, really they, liking it. They filled it. And they, you know, they did to this division what they were never able to do to women's bantamweight, and what they were never able to do to flyweight. Which is like flyweight at the most had thirty-five fighters in it. I think women's bantamweight at most has had twenty-seven. Well, no, I have thirty-two right now. So they're really actually trying to fill that division. But like women's flyweight has only been around for like a year, year and a half, or two years, I guess. And they've already got 50 fighters in it. Like, they're just packing it. It's great. And yeah. it just goes to show that there's no reason that they should have even been thinking about doing away with men's flyweight. No. Because there's, like, there's way more talent at men's yeah. flyweight than there is at female flyweight. Yeah. That brings us to a catchweight bout. Claudio Silva, Cole Williams, and... I mean, we all knew this was coming, but it's always great to see a fighter do exactly what you know they're going to do in a fight, you know? Yeah, this was great. Um, <laughs> uh, Williams, he came out and popped Silva right in the mouth. Or, uh, Silva popped uh, Williams right in the mouth. Williams responded with this clubbing right hand that staggered Silva. Mm -hmm. And just when it looked like a brawl was about to break out, Silva closes the distance and true to form, takes the fight to the ground, takes the back, a little bit of ground and pound, and then the neck presented itself. And Williams respectfully tapped out, who, by the way, short notice replacement. That's why he looked all ballooned up and like he didn't belong there. Yeah. Yeah. Although, you know, I, I saw somebody it, before the fight, they were like, oh, the UFC should like, you know, pay his fine for him for, uh, taking a, sh a fight on sh short notice, even though he missed weight. I was like, man, he's lucky that Silva took this fight. Cause if Silva hadn't taken that fight with him coming in overweight, he would have been cut immediately. Like UFC is not going to, they're not going to treat Cole Williams. Like he did the many favors, even though he did. No, you know? they don't treat anybody like that. No. And especially to like, I I'm pretty sure from what I've, I've heard from different interviews with different people, uh, who fought, you know, came in on short notice for, and things for the UFC. Like, they ask you when they call you for that short notice debut if you can make weight. And, of course, every fighter want, who wants the contract just says yes. Mm -hmm. And they get, they are, you know, Sean Shelby is not a happy man, if I think, if you come in and you're not on weight. Like, they basically, they take you at your word that you're going to show up right. just right. Unless, like, you, you, you are, like, an Anthony Pettis or you've paid your due severely. Yeah. But if, if you're Cole Williams, yeah, you're, you're on thin ice. 
there there are a few outstanding situations. Maybe if it's somebody being called in on like a day's notice or something like that, then you know the UFC is going to be like, well, yeah, well, you know, you, this guy really did us a favor. But if it's a week, even they're going to, you know, not going to be happy about that. So Williams will almost certainly get another shot because Silva took this fight, and hopefully he'll be in better shape for the next one. But that's just a rough, rough card to draw on your UFC debut. Yeah, Silva did his thing though, and he traded yeah. ATT for this one. So a new shift in training camps. Thirteen straight wins and two fights already in 2019. Yeah, I know it's a gift. This is unheard of. It is, Claudio Silva. I, I'm hoping that you know he can maybe turn around and fight like I don't know Warley Alves or even I don't even just like Randy Brown or somebody else. Just stay busy. You know, just fight somebody. Just keep fighting people. Maybe Neil Magny will get his USADA thing sorted out. I would watch Claudio Silva fight Neil Magny. Sure. I forgot about Neil Magny. Yeah. He's been dealing with them for a minute now. How about the referee Gary Copeland getting roasted <laughs> before this fight? <laughs> Poor Gary. That was amazing. John Anik's like, oh, Copeland got his morning lift in today. <laughs> And then Dominic Cruz is like, oh, he's got on Demetrius Johnson's shirt, I see. The highlight of Dominic Cruz's commentary career right there. Yeah, he I, t- I will forgive him so many ills just for that joke. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess he'll get a pass for, for fumbling over trying to change the Von Flu. Yeah, the yeah. Joke. We'll, we'll forgive him the Von Flu. Just for making fun of for uh, for making fun of the ref wearing Demetrius Johnson's shirt. Yeah, that's his pass. That's his pass. And that brings us to a woman's flyweight bout: Miranda Granger, Hannah Goldie, and uh, it was a fight. Granger looked a lot better than I expected her to. Honestly, her striking looked a lot better than it had regionally. And for Goldie, she's gonna have to figure out how to be a kind of low output power striker who's always walking away from her opponents and taking power off her own shots. Yeah, I'm not sure that really exists. No, I don't think it is. <laughs> yeah, she looked not ready. Yep. She looked not ready. Is isn't that Alex Nicholson's uh old lady? <laughs> old lady. Like uh, think- baby mama, I think is the term. I think it is, yeah. Yeah, I believe it is. Well, yeah. this uh, She just looked kind of not ready. And, she, I mean, she was giving up seven inches of reach here and, and, like, didn't fight as if she needed... She didn't fight with any urgency to get on the inside. Even when Granger would gift her the distance being closed... Because Granger would, would land on the outside and then punch her way into the clinch. But like once she got there, nothing really happened. So Goldie had the distance closed for her, but never really capitalized on it. So good win for Granger, who remains undefeated and is hoping to get a full fight camp next, as well as a matchup in her usual division of 115 pounds. So. Yeah, they're both talking about heading down to 115, which. Makes this all the more concerning for Goldie because she can't even write it off. Like, oh, she was a 125er, though. But no, but she can. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's just a matter of her. Like you were saying, you can't you can't be like a power striker moving backwards. You can't be a five foot four power striker who likes to back up all the time. Like it, she's trying to be Tyron Woodley without. Like, I mean, and even like you can't Tyron Woodley's not game is not a game to build anybody else's game around. It's amazing that backing into the cage and throwing power shots off of it worked so well for Tyron Woodley. But that's also because Woodley is like one of the fastest, hardest hitting fighters in in welterweight in the welterweight division. Yeah. You know, Goldie does not have anything resembling that kind of explosiveness. No. She's not closing distance, anything like that, which means that you expose all the problems inherent in 
backing away from your opponent and giving them real estate to close you down and hurt you and lead as a shorter, stockier striker. Yeah, tough. She's got an uphill battle ahead of her yep. if she wants to do this. On that note, though, I think we should wrap things up. At the end of the day, impressive, impressive performance for Covington. No matter how, no matter what we want to say of Robbie Lawler's performance, which was insanely strange, it's still, you know, it's the kind of performance that Covington needed to really show. I mean, he already had proven that he was going to be a title challenger in this division, but it's the, the kind of performance he needed to show he was a title threat. Yeah. Like he had his little interim title thing. Yeah. He still walks around with it. He never yeah. lost it. He's on a tear. His wrestling is really tough to deal with if you don't have the same kind of, you know, chops yeah. to lean on. Um, but, like, despite him outstriking Robbie Lawler the way he did, we know where his striking really is. Like, we, we know. We know the deal. So he's going to probably get the title shot. Miles Vidal is going to get snubbed. It's uh, politics. I'd hate to say it, but, I mean, if politics is the name of the game, who more suiting than Colby Covington, who's, like, <laughs> Mr. Politics right now? It's true. It's true. On that note, find me on Twitter at these ain't time. You can find Eddie on Twitter at the Eddie Mercado. Eddie, you got an interview coming up? Oh uh, yeah. So dropping tomorrow on this channel, an interview I did for Bloody Elbow with the art of self defense writer slash director Riley Stearns, who is actually a BJJ purple belt who will be keep competing at Worlds in December. Uh, it's a great movie in my opinion. Go check it out. Stearns is a cool dude himself. Shout out to June Williams for helping me put that together. And Kid Nate for believing in me. Aw, as always. He, he, and uh, you can find that on Bloody Elbow Presents and BloodyElbow.com. As with all our other shows, give us a like, subscribe, find us on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, all that good stuff. We're out there. And stay tuned to the channel for all our other shows we got coming up. Level Change Podcast, Milky Cookie Show, uh, Vivisection, If I Did It, Care Don't Care, all that stuff. So thanks, everyone, and we will see you again soon.